Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us and worshiping with us online this beautiful Sunday. I wish we were together in this sanctuary where I'm standing right now. I wish that when you walk through the door, one of our awesome ushers was there to welcome you and make sure that you feel at home when you come to worship. So as much as we don't have that, I want you to know that we hope you feel at home as you've come to join us in worship on this Sunday. You know, typically we'd hand somebody a bulletin that looks something like this as they walk through the door. And uh, I don't have a bulletin to hand you today, but I will give you some announcements and ways that you can uh, get and stay connected during this time. Uh, One of the ways that you could do that is by following us on Facebook. We have lots of information there that's up to date, day to day. So make sure you follow us there for all information about ministries and how to stay connected. Another way is through our website. In fact, if it's your first time joining us in worship today, uh, you're definitely going to want to go to our website where we have a Get Connected page where you can give us some of your information and we would love to follow up with you. One of the pastors from our church will contact you to make sure that you are able to find ways to stay connected with us. Uh, We have day-to-day regular announcements that are coming out, so make sure that you stay uh, connected in these various ways. We're following uh, the governor's uh, restrictions at this point, and we are uh, also looking to our denominational leaders in the Assemblies of God for leadership as we navigate these days and weeks as far as what that will look like. But we cannot wait. I can't wait until we're back together again worshiping together, hearing our voices as we sing unto the Lord, as we clap, as we raise up a shout. Um, So as much as we're not there just yet, I know that we're all uh, gearing up and getting excited for when we can come back together and do it in person. But today, we're glad that you are with us. We pray that you enjoy worship, that you enjoy the word, that you are encouraged, that you are edified, that the Lord speaks to you in a powerful and beautiful way. And so before we get ready to enter into a time of music worship, I want to invite you to join me as I open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we recognize that you are here, that you are with us, that you are speaking to us. We thank you for all that you've done to make this even possible. Uh, We thank you for your servants who have worked so hard, Lord, that we can have this broadcasted via video and that the sound, uh, the preaching of your gospel and the invitation to worship could be heard, not just even in the South Bay, but all around the world. So Lord, would you guide today's service? Would you speak? Would our hearts be open to hear you? Would our ears be wide open and our minds be shaped and transformed so that we might learn what it means to live faithfully unto you? We give you today's service in Christ's name. Amen. Lord, we come before you and we just worship your name. We gather together in our own homes to bless you, to honor you, and to ask that you open up our eyes to see the things that you see, the way that you see them. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. to see you, to 
goodness I will sing of your love though the seasons come quickly you've always been enough though the night may get darker though the waiting seems long you have always been faithful to remind me of your love you friend of mine so I'll remind my soul to bless you standing firm upon your truth knowing you cannot be shaken I've seen what you can do
So if you've been paying attention in the news, if you've been looking at uh, different reports that are coming out, uh, obviously I think it's clear that just about every headline that we read um, or every story that comes on on our TV stations is going to be in somehow uh, directly or indirectly related to the pandemic. Um, and one of the threads that I follow as a sports fan is what's taking place in the world of sports. You know, this one moment where we have so much time or some of us have so much time and we're at home, we have our TVs in front of us. This is like the premier time that many folks would get glued to their TV watching their favorite sport. We don't have access to that right now because of the ways that may pose a danger um, to the athletes and to fans and spectators. But the one thing that I have seen that's been coming out in uh, predictions and projections about when baseball will return or when football will return or what uh, college football is thinking as we gear up for what the fall may look like is a, a phased in process and uh, just about across the board one of the common uh, threads in all of those different storylines and projections is that they are anticipating that when uh, teams are able to compete again when baseball is able to resume if the football season is able to get kick-started is they're thinking that they'll play games but there won't be any fans or spectators in the stands right they, they want to get back to the entertainment aspect of it but they don't want to allow thousands and thousands tens of thousands of people coming together in one area because of the potential risk that that may pose for people's health and it really makes me think of something interesting as I uh, envision this uh, spectator list or spectator free zone. Uh, it really makes me think about the way in which the New Testament church started out with this same idea. And the idea is this, that there are no spectators, only those who are participating in the game itself. There are no fans, only those who are actually in the game. Uh, so I want to call today's message, as we started off the series in Advancing the Kingdom, I want to call this message Advancing the Kingdom, a spectator-free zone. So in order for us to understand that, I want us to, to think about Ephesians 4. We started out last week by looking at Ephesians 4, and so today, in order to really understand uh, what Ephesians 4 is all about, I do think that there's a verse in Ephesians 2 and one in Ephesians 3 that really gets at what we're studying in Ephesians chapter 4. So Ephesians 2, verse 21, says this, In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. So already the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus and he's saying, I'm, the Lord is building something here. He's building a church that's coming together that's going to be a building, one building that's joined together. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 says this, Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So again, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, chapter 2 and chapter 3, we're starting to see that, that God is doing something. He's building something. And, and he's able to do abundantly above and beyond what we can ask or imagine. And so as we get ready to dive into Ephesians 4 and continue to unpack that, my, my prayer and my hope today is that we, we really take a deep dive into the words of Ephesians chapter 4 because of all of the wonderful things that we could learn from this amazing chapter. So really one of the, the threads leading up to Ephesians 4 is this idea that this church in Ephesus is made up of Jews and Gentiles. And Paul's teaching that they're no longer two people. 
right? He says that, that Christ came to, to, to remove the dividing wall, and there's no longer a Jew side and a Gentile side, but we are all called together as one body of Christ. This idea of, of being one and being united is very significant in the epistle to the Ephesians. There's no separation, whether it be because of race, whether it be because of wealth status or class, whether it be because of gender, whatever it may be, the Apostle Paul is saying we're called to be one church. And, and I, I imagine that the reason why he's emphasizing this point is because this church was struggling with how they could be one people because of the differences that they had. Now, we at, at Mission Ebenezer are very clear that we want to surrender and submit the divisions that can occur because of differences. And we believe that God calls us beautifully together. He calls us beautifully together to be different, but to be one, right? God's not calling us to all be the same person. God's not calling us to all be the same culture, all be the same race. But what he's saying is we're all called differently to be one. And so as, as Paul's teaching uh, the church in Ephesus, he's essentially saying to them, we need to fight to be one. And so there are really three uh, uh, focus points in this chapter that I believe Paul's getting to. And I'm going to cut right to the chase and then we'll work backward uh, to get back there as we work through the verses in chapter 4. But really what I believe Paul is challenging the church away from, what he's saying, I don't want you to be this kind of church. Paul's saying this, I don't want you to be, one, immature. I don't want you to be, two, noncommittal. And I don't want you to be, three, a fractured church. Let me say it one more time. Paul says, I don't want you to be immature. I don't want you to be noncommittal. And I don't want you to be a fractured church. Now, if you could keep those three things in mind, all of Ephesians chapter 4 is going to make sense. Because Paul's saying this, I believe that there's some folks in the church in Ephesus that are a little bit immature in their faith and in their spiritual maturity. They need to mature. I believe there are some who aren't sure whether or not they're ready to commit and be all in and understand that they are called to be the body of Christ. I want those folks to learn what commitment is about. And then he says, I believe there are some who are causing divisions, who, who are causing separation, who, who aren't allowing the Holy Spirit to bring them together as one church. And Paul is saying to them, we should not be a fractured church, but we should be a unified church. So with some of that context, let's look at God's word. And I'm just going to read through a section of Ephesians chapter 4, and then we're going to go back and start working our way through it little by little. So starting in chapter 4, verse 1 of Ephesians. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and builds itself up in love as each part 
does its work. Spectator free zone. So we started out by talking about what this picture, imagine this huge arena, imagine the Coliseum or the new stadium that's being built over in Inglewood or the Staples Center or Dodger Stadium. Imagine these huge arenas where no one is in the stands and the only action that's taking place is what's happening down at the field level, level or on the court. In some ways, what Paul is teaching the church in Ephesus is, if you are called by Christ, if he's called you out and he calls you by name, and you refer to yourself as a Christian, one who is called to live their life worthy of the calling that Christ has given us, then, then what, what, what Paul is saying is, then you have a job to do. There is work for you to do. There is action to be part of. There are no spectators when it comes to the mission of God. There are no spectators when it comes to what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Every single one of us have been given something to do. So let's rewind. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the chapter and start breaking it down little by little to understand what Paul means. So starting in verse 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. A prisoner of in the Lord. What Paul is saying here is he doesn't start by saying, I, Paul, the one who has all the authority to tell you exactly what to do and how to live. He doesn't start by feeling entitled and calling upon all the ways that he is elevated. He starts by surrendering himself. Why? Because Paul is going to teach us that it's important for us to learn how to surrender ourselves. So he begins by saying, I am a prisoner. I'm a prisoner in the Lord. I'm not one who gets to call the shots. I'm not in charge. The Lord is in charge. I do what the Lord says. So he starts by making mention of his lowly status so that he can begin to speak to the church in Ephesus because I believe that Paul thought some of the folks in the church in Ephesus thought they were better than others. So Paul says, I'm nothing but a prisoner. And he says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, I want you to think about that for a second and say, what is the calling that I've been called to? And does my life match up to that? Does my actions, do my words, does the way that I live my life between Sunday to the next Sunday reflect the calling that I've received? What is that calling? The calling that you and I have received is out of darkness and into light. We're called away from a life of sin and into a life of salvation. We're called away from a, light, a life of darkness and into a, a life filled with the light of Christ. Therefore, if we are called by that calling, is my life reflecting that calling? It's a simple question, but it's one that we ought to ask every single day. Am I living my life? Am I leading my life in a way that is worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ? Verse 2 says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Oh, man, that's a mouthful. He just kind of throws that in there in verse 2. But there are so many things about those things that he calls us to that are not easy to do. I know that many of us are, uh, I was discussing this a little bit earlier with the, the folks who are here in the sanctuary with me, and, and we were talking a little bit about how challenging it is in this season to practice those things like humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another when we are cooped up with each other inside of our walls. Now, I know that at some point in these last few weeks, you one of the fuses that you have in your system has burnt. I know that you've said something to somebody that you wish you didn't say. I know that you re reacted to one of your kids in a way that you're like, okay, maybe that was a little too harsh. If that's not the case, then tell me what you're doing because I have not figured it out just yet. But as I think about Paul's and he's saying, I want you to practice these things. Now, for me, in order for me to understand something, for it to sink deep, I kind of have to think of, okay, what's the opposite of what Paul is saying here? And how does that teach me about what I need to strive to as a believer? So I think of the opposites of the, of the words that we just looked at. The opposite of humility, pride, right? The opposite of gentleness, harshness. The opposite of patience, impatience. The opposite of bearing with one another in love, being fed up with one another. You see, it's a little easier for me, I think, to have to be proud, uh, proud and prideful. It's a little easier for me to be harsh uh, and, and, uh, and maybe a little bit uh, quick with my words and, and, not, and not really biting my tongue. It's a little easier for me to get impatient, right? Um, it's a little easy for me to get fed up with others. And Paul is saying, no, I'm, we're, we're called to a higher calling with one another. 
Right? He's saying if we're going to be one church, if we're going to come together and really embody what it means to be those who are called after the character of Christ, then we have to practice these things. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3 says, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Of peace. You see, the thing about our flesh is that our flesh does not naturally uh, mesh well with unity. Our flesh wants to do its own thing. We have a mind of our own. We have an opinion. But when it, talk, when it comes to trying to, to practice unity together, we have to, in, in, in some ways, practice unity of the spirit. Right? Unity of the spirit, not unity of the flesh. Right? Paul says, I want you to practice unity of the spirit. In other words, Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own. We can't do this on our own. We need you to work in us to bring us together to be one. Whether that be maybe one as a couple at home, maybe as married couples. Lord, we need the unity of the Spirit to keep our marriage bond alive during some of these challenging times when we're maybe uh, having, being forced to have some really in-depth conversations that otherwise we might not have if we were running in 100 miles per hour in different directions. But here we are stuck together, and we need the Spirit's guidance to keep the unity of the Spirit, unity in our families, unity in our church. So verse 4 goes on to say, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now I want you to notice that the word one shows up here seven times. It could be eight if you include the reference to the Father as well, just in three verses. Again, the word one shows up here seven times in a short three verses. In other words, what Paul is trying to teach the church is, hey, we are, we are not our own at this point. When we have surrendered under the will of Christ, we all have come together to be one. Right? One body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, God the Father. Right? And it says, who is above all, through all, and in all. And I want us to think about the fact that by placing God as above all, through all, and in all, what he's saying here is, I am not above all through all, and in all. You are not above all, through all, and in all. But God, our Heavenly Father, is above all, He's through all, and He's in all. Therefore, as we place God in that, uh, that space and remove ourselves from that space, then we are ready to start moving toward what it means to actually be one as the body of Christ. So we need to stop separating ourselves. We need to stop elevating ourselves. We need to stop acting like we can actually be Christian without having Christ in the middle of this. He's the one that draws us together, that makes us one together. Verse 7 says, But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And I'm going to skip to verse 11. And the gifts that he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Now think about that for a second. It's, what he's saying is there are lots of different kinds of gifts, various gifts that are coming together. Right? You could think about it in terms of title, or you could think about it in terms of function. If you think about it in terms of function, he's saying the church is here, and leadership within the church is here to help us drive forward mission, conviction, inspiration, care, and education. He's saying we have to have these functions in the body of Christ as leaders. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 12 says, all of that, all of those leadership gifts come together to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to equip the saints. So the pastors, the apostles, the prophets, teachers, evangelists, all are coming together to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So who are the saints? Some of you are like, oh, cool, awesome. The saints get to do the ministry, man. That's great. You are the saints. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, he's your Lord and he's your Savior, that means you are being made holy. You are being sanctified. And and saints is just simply another way of, of saying those who are being made holy. So in other words, that's you and that's me. Every single one of us are part of the saints that we're reading about here in Ephesians chapter 4. So what we're seeing is that the work of ministry now is for every single believer. 
Some of you might be thinking, wait, man, I thought pastors, I thought you had to like go to seminary and, and I thought you had to be ordained and, and, and I, I thought you had to, you know, have certain gifts that are, that are you know, like gifts like preaching and I thought you had to have all these different things in order to be called to ministry. And what I would say is absolutely not. Every single believer in the body of Christ is called to ministry. The question is, what ministry? Right? All of us have different ministry that we're called to. All of us have a different contribution. Right? The, the literal definition of ministry, right? diakonia, which simply means service or ministry or work. That's where we get the word deacon from. It basically means being able to do something for God, to advance the mission of God in the body of Christ. Guess who gets to do that? Every single believer, babies, grandparents, great-grandparents, those who are called into vocational ministry, those who, who, who work and their job is a ministry job, those who work a, a, a different job, a secular job, but they serve the Lord in a different way. Every single one of us is called to some kind of ministry. So I want to clear that up for a second because I think we have these misconceptions in the church that like, no, the pastoral team, the pastoral staff, they're the ones who really do the ministry. And what I would say is no, if pastors are doing their job right, what they are doing is they are equipping the saints, all of you, all of us, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. There's so much work to do in the world, serving God, to expand the kingdom, to preach the gospel so that others may see the gospel. You see, many of us, the, the calling that we have to preach the gospel is going to be the way that we live our lives. And the way that we live our lives causes our neighbors and our co-workers and our family members to ask questions about why we live our lives that way. And it gives us an opportunity as believers to communicate the gospel that there's a God, that there's a, a man named Jesus who came and he died and he rose again. Again, and he came to take away our sin and to welcome us into the heavenly family that our, that our heavenly father has welcomed us into. We have an opportunity to express and explain the truth and the core of the gospel. And it starts by the way that we live our lives. It goes all the way back to verse one. Lead a life worthy of the calling. So every single one of us has a ministry. Right? It could be that some of us, our ministry is, man, God's called you to serve your family and to raise up your children so that they know who Jesus is, so that Jesus is planted deeply and rooted deeply in their hearts and in their lives. That's an excellent ministry. Some of us, you might have a call to ministry to youth. Some of us, it might be through education. Some of it may be through, through medicine. You might be out serving right now. For others, it might be through coaching or whatever it may be. But every single one of us has been called to ministry. The role of pastors and leaders is to equip the body of Christ for the work of ministry. So everybody is called to a ministry. It's not just reserved for those who are called to the pastorate. Right? And, and, and it's just this sense of, of taking up the work, taking up the work. I always have loved the definition of ordination uh, when somebody is ordained, um, which is typically the, uh, the formal process of blessing someone into formal ministry. And the, 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 the origin of that word to ordain simply means to fill one's hands. And I believe that God, wherever you are right now, is speaking to you to simply say, I want to fill your hands because I have work for you to do. And being connected to your church is going to help clarify the work that you specifically have to do. And because we all get to be part of this together. L.A. is too big. Uh, the South Bay is too big. The world is too big for a few people who have the title pastor to carry forward the work of ministry. Every single one of us is called into that. Here's the beautiful thing about why I think it's so great that every single one of us has a ministry that we are called to. One of the things is because I believe that as we are discerning uh, what it means to be useful, what it means to put our hands to the work, what it means to put our, our gifts and our skills into service so that God's name would be glorified, is that it, it, it pr provides for us an opportunity to make our way closer and closer into the core of the body of Christ. Uh, one of the things that we study uh, at school where I work at Azusa Pacific with students as they think about ways in which they uh, connect is through these four words, relationship, membership, partnership, and ownership. I'm going to say them one more time. Relationship, membership, partnership, 
and ownership. Relationship is, man, you get to know somebody, and that's great, and you start to form a relationship. The next level of that is membership, which simply means, you know what, this is, this is a place where I belong. The next step of that is partnership. You know what, I want to find ways in which I can connect with those relationships and the fact that I belong here so that it could start moving. And then the last step is ownership. You know what, I'm not just a member, but this is my church. This is my ministry. This is my community. This is my calling. This is my service. And when we get to the point as believers where we are taking ownership of our faith, where we're taking ownership of the ministry that God has called us to, where we're taking ownership of the church that he's called us to, we'll then begin to see God take off in ways that we can be prepared for exciting things that God wants to do through every single one of us as we put forward and simply say, Lord, use me. Here I am. Use my time. Use my gifts. Use my passion. Use my talent. Use my burden. Use the things that break my heart so that I could bring all those forward and simply say, Father, here I am right now. Here I am in May 2020. Uh, I don't know exactly why you've created me and why you've placed me in this space, but I believe it's for a reason. And I want to give you myself. I want to give you my life so that you could do something with what I have to offer. Relationship, membership, partnership, and ownership. And it says, it says, why do we, why do the equips, uh, the, the saints be equipped for ministry? Why? For the building up of the body of Christ, for the edification of the body of Christ. Um, so let me just give you a quick little analogy. Um, when, when we all think about the, the role that we have to play as God is calling us and equipping us as a church, remember, like I said, ministry is all of our work. It's not just my work or Pastor Josh's work or, or, or whoever it may be, but it's all of our work. We are called into this ministry together. I can remember some really uh, great moments uh, growing up in athletics, playing sports, where some of the best coaches that I played with, whenever we would you know, come up against a difficult spot where we would be lacking motivation or tired or feeling defeated or constantly making mistakes, is the coach would come and he would look at the, the older guys, the seniors or the captains, and he would simply say, hey, I'm going to my office. This is your team. Whatever you guys need to talk about, you guys talk about, but I'm going because this is your team. And it would be in those moments where these players, these young guys, you know, I can remember those kinds of conversations going all the way back to me being 12, 13, 14 years old. All of a sudden, the people who really cared would bring the team together and, and they would take ownership of the, those moments and simply say, all right, guys, come on. Coach isn't even here. Who are we? What are we going to do? Are we going to just do whatever coach says we're going to do? Or is this our thing? What do we want to see happen? And it's those moments where, where we could take ownership. Now, the same exact thing, I believe, needs to happen in the body of Christ where the body of Christ says, I'm taking ownership. This is my church. I'm going to help this church move forward. And as we prepare for what things will look like both in this season and as we re-enter and move out of the pandemic, I want us to be the kind of church that, that we're not just a few folks and a bunch of spectators, but the spectators, the, 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 the seats in the bleachers are empty and everybody's on the field. I would love to see us move to be the kind of church where every single person is taking action and is ready to get in the game. Verse 13 says this, until all of us, now here's what it's leading toward, right? All of this stuff that we've been reading is leading toward this. Until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity. I want you to say maturity with me on the count of three. Ready? Maturity. One, two, three. All right. I heard that from a few of you. Way to go. Um, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Again, verse 13. Until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Paul's saying, I, want you to be, I don't want you to be an immature church. I don't want you to be the kind of people that are just tossed back and forth, left and right, from whatever comes your way. You hit a, a challenge in life and all of a sudden you're MIA. Nobody knows where you are because something didn't work out the way you thought it should work out, right? All of a sudden you, 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 you begin to, to come across a difficult question or a difficult season and, and next thing you know your faith is completely destroyed and, and, and it's nowhere to be found. He, Paul is saying, man, I want you, church, 
to be a mature church, to be rooted, to be firmly established, not tossed around by the wind and the waves, not tossed around by life, not tossed around by a pandemic, not tossed around by your financial situation, not tossed around by your relationships. I want you to be a mature church who is rooted and established no matter what storms, no matter what difficulty may come your way. To be mature, to grow up, to be responsible, to be faithful, to be fruitful, no matter what may be going on around us. The Apostle Paul is calling us to a higher calling. It makes me think of, uh, of this kind of uh, way that uh, I've understood um, this, this kind of maturity or this growth process. Um, and, and it's kind of a, an apprenticeship model, so track with me if you will. Um, but if somebody's an apprentice and they're learning from a master, right? Uh, it goes in this particular progression. Follow with me. The first one is the, the, the master craftsman uh, is, is the person who does the action. So it says, I do, okay? The next step is, I do and you watch. The next step is, I do and you help. The next step is, we do together. The next step is, you do and I help. The next step is, you do and I watch. And the last step is, you do. You see, this process of maturity is God is calling his people right there where you are. You're probably on your couch or maybe you're on a chair. Maybe you're outside enjoying a beautiful Sunday and you're, you're watching on your iPad or on your phone. Well, however it is that you're watching or listening to this sermon, I believe God is speaking to you. Yes, I'm talking specifically to you. God is speaking to you simply saying this, I am preparing you. I am getting you ready. I am going to fill your hands so that you are ready to take ownership of your role as a believer and as a member of the body of Christ. It's time to stop sitting in the stands and spectating, watching, and observing, but it's time for you to grow into maturity. It's time for you to come in ready to use all that you have to give in service of the kingdom of God. What will that look like in your life? What would that look like in your life for you to be able to demonstrate the kind of maturity that Paul is calling us into. Now, I pray that today's message, as we looked at Ephesians 4, man, we, we took some time through this passage, and we looked at some critical words to understand what God may be calling us to, but I believe that God is calling us to be a spectator-free zone. In other words, I believe God's calling us to be a church that's filled with people who can't wait to get in on the action of the game. They want to put their hand to work. They want to use their time, their energy, their talents, their skills, their resources wisely. And they want for those things to come together to bring honor and glory to God. Are you one of those people? I'm curious if as you hear the words of the Apostle Paul, as you hear this call that we have to be part of the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up and may be matured even unto the point where we as the body match the head who is Christ. I wonder where you are in that process. Are you, are you watching? Are you on the sideline? Are you in the stands? Or are you, Lord, are you saying, Lord, put me in. I'm ready to put my gifts into motion, into action. I want to I wanna be part of your solution. I want to be part of the ministry that you have. Um, so I encourage you, church, to uh, contemplate this, uh, this question as we, uh, as we reflect on Ephesians chapter 4. And I pray that uh, this message has spoken to you in a special way today. Once again, thanks again for uh, joining us and worshiping with us on this morning. We thank you for uh, being part of uh, this community, even though it's virtual. We want to remind you of the various ways to stay connected. Uh, we have uh, a page set up on our website for those who uh, this is your first time you want to get connected and receive more information from our leadership team. Please make sure you go there and submit a form. We can't wait to uh, get to meet you a little bit, and we definitely can't wait to see you in person once we're able to do that again. Just want to remind you of all the different ways to give uh, that you can find. There's uh, push pay, there's uh, opportunities, and you can find out all that information. And just, uh, again, all the information that you need to know during this time is accessible on our social media, our Facebook. Check us out on Instagram, as well as uh, stay up to date on our website uh, with up-to-date information. Um, and lastly, uh, for those who, who've tuned in, and uh, maybe you haven't been to church in a while, uh, or maybe this is the first time in a while that you've uh, listened or uh, been part of a sermon, uh, you've been part of church, I want to make sure that you are, uh, you have an opportunity uh, today. If you were listening to the, the message and something stirred in your heart, 
And uh, you might think to yourself, I'm not ready for that, and, but I want to be. Or uh, I'm not too sure what the calling is on my life and what that would look like. If, if you're in a place where you've never had an opportunity to invite Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to do that. Um, so I want to close in a word of prayer, and specifically for those who, uh, who may want to uh, use this as an opportunity to surrender your life. You want to let go. You've been trying to do it on your own, and you're tired, you're frustrated, you're fed up, you've hit your, uh, your limit, and you're ready to, to give up, and you're ready to let God take over. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to encourage you uh, to let you know that that would be the best decision that you'd ever make in your life, is to invite uh, Christ to be the center of your life, to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Um, so as we close today, I'm going to close in a word of prayer. And uh, if that's you, as, as I close in prayer, then I want to encourage you to also indicate to us online uh, through our website that this was a first decision for you uh, to give your life to Christ. And we want to follow up to make sure that all the resources, uh, we want to send you a packet um, that you can have access to so that you can continue to, to cultivate your new uh, relationship in Christ. So uh, would you all join me, church, as we close in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity today um, to dive into your word. We thank you for this chance to worship together, uh, to be encouraged in song and to be encouraged by uh, this message from Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, thanks for the, the great words that the Apostle Paul has given us uh, that instruct us and teach us what it means to uh, be edified, to be one church, not fractured, um, not separated, um, not immature, but mature in every single way. Um, and Lord, specifically, I want to pray for anybody who might be listening or watching and they've never had an opportunity to uh, accept you as Lord and Savior of their life. Uh, Father, I pray right now um, that by your name, uh, you would enter into their heart, that as they, for they ask you for the forgiveness of sin and confess um, that they are broken and that they've fallen short, uh, that you would uh, fulfill your promise, that you would forgive them of their sin, that you would heal them and that you would uh, give them salvation today. Um, so Lord, I pray that you would walk with them, that this would not be the last day, but the first day of this new journey, and that you would surround them with your uh, family uh, to help nurture them and cultivate them as they grow as believers. Uh, so Father, would you be with those? Would you be with all of us who've come together today? Uh, and would you continue to allow us to seek you in, in faithfulness in every single way? Uh, we thank you for this uh, time together. We give it to you in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, and we will see you soon.